the other ones go like sales and customer service look at this. Eighty percent. Okay, don't look so happy. You should look very happy with this one because look, the cash occupation very low. I see the McKinsey one giving 60%, 70% about accountants and all this. Okay, so you know what that means? They don't know. <laughs> they don't know. And also, this is kind of a bad way to represent. It's not a question of a profession being in the way. It's a question of what functions of that particular profession are going to be replaced. And what percentage of that profession is of your job. And one more thing, by replacing that function, what other, fun uh, what other professional functions you are creating? Because that is always a thing. For example, we have been talking, we're going to have a call with Andrea here, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, Wednesday, on cybersecurity. And we are talking about, uh, not about cybersecurity, blockchain. And you're going to have Andrea and one of our other PhD students talk about the blockchain studies. And there, there is a thing called smart contract. And the smart contract is basically a function, like a little program, that if this happens, do this. And it will replace a lot of things you do in audit. Automatically, you will not need auditors. But does that uh, totally eliminate the auditor in that particular piece? <coughs> because someone will have to look at that program and decide if it's done right and it continue being yeah. done right and the data being fed to it is the right data. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what does, what does this conclude? Conclude that it's not a question about profession being replaced. It's a question about what functions the profession being replaced and what new function is that going to be. And maybe what we expect out of auditing now is very modest. And we will try to do a better audit with much more functions in the future, which I think is needed. But it's very interesting, and I know you look sad when you see this. This is not the worst I see. Uh, big data is the oil of the 21st century, but all I tell you that is inherently done. It does not actually do anything unless you know how to use it. Oil is useless, stick good until it's refined into fuel. Big data's version into refined fuel, proprietary algorithm that solves specific problems on living future will be the secret sauce of successful organization. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, the uh, economists had a big front page article talking about data is replacing oil. Meaning oil, in the old days, the largest companies in the United States were oil, oil companies. Exxon, Exxon Nobel, etc. Now the biggest company in the United States is Apple, Google, biggest in market valuation. And oil is not as valuable as they Okay, just uh, uh, just two examples is Google's proprietary right algorithm of the driver and scan, high frequency trading. And we will talk more about this. And now the final thing they talk about this is something interesting, is monetizing. What does it mean, monetizing technology? They kind of like selling that idea to other companies so that they can use it. Yeah, yeah, that's a way you do it. Monetizing means making money, transforming an idea into something that's profitable. And I think every year, a small but bigger percentage of this class is not going to go into big four and except it's going to do ventures. And related ventures, or June calls, internet of services, audit service networks, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and then interesting thing here is, how do you protect your ideas? Have you been seeing the big, ugly, 
thing happening with Google and Uber together? Have you followed it? A uh, guy was developing the self-driving car part of the project at Google. And he, at the same time he was an employee, one of the top developers of Google, he also had a company. And this company was selling intellectual assets, meaning programming, to Google. So you are empo I am an employee of Rutgers, and at the same time I'm a supplier of Rutgers, selling the things that I'm developing for Rutgers. But that's a questionable statement. It wasn't clear what he was about. Okay. Then one day, he quit Google, and he went to Uber developed their self-driving car effort. And then a few months later, they got sued by Google. And now he got fired from Uber. And if you read the stories, no one knows, I mean, I don't know. Uh, what they say is that Google was quite allowing of this happen. Because Google gives you a day a week to develop your own ideas. Professor, the same thing. Uh, technically, I have one day a week to do consulting. Full-time professors of the universe. So I could literally develop things on my fifth day and sell them to others. Other people say you are working on, on Rutgers time. Five days a week you are working on this and you are trying to sell it to us. So, problem, right? And interestingly enough, this guy actually, before he joined Google, he was selling already some things to, to Google. Then he joined Google and then he developed new things that were very similar to the things that he was working at Google. And then he left. And basically, his, they are being sued because they say that he downloaded like 40,000 proprietary documents and code <coughs> from Google and took it to his new company, which was servicing Google. You know how this is going to be resolved, right? How? Both on the mess. They are concerned. And the question is how much? Or who pays who? But we pretty much think it's Uber is going to pay Uber. Or they're going to have to stop their car, the automatic car effort, and uh, redevelop new technology, or having to license it for some things. So that's how we do it. But uh, so now you are stuck, Tom, because your lawyer is going to give us long <coughs> legal advice here. Do you agree with what I said here? That this is a big mess? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a huge mess, very difficult to protect. Computer programs are against patent infringement, very difficult to protect ideas. And even protecting it is just an exercise of doing it. You really need to move your technology to be protected. You can't just stay with your old technology. And one more interesting thing that a few of you don't know is that a lot of the public code, meaning computer programs, are really the things that build proprietary applications. So when you are writing code and piggybacking on other people's code, a lot of things you are using are public code. People share, correct? Right? You're allowed to say yes. <laughs> and and so, so people say, oh, you can say no. No, it's OK. But people share. And so the whole idea that you patent something is very confusing when you're talking about you know, 10 million lines of code, of which 8 million are in the public domain somewhere. A uh, million and a half you develop based on things that already existed. And then half a million you really develop, but you really kind of like copy the same ideas out of some other place. Very difficult. Very difficult to, to deal with this. And 
I, I have actually a whole set of slides about the new regulations needed. Um, and they are based on the Economist article by IT. They would shoot me if they said that, if I told them that it was uh, that. And this is the whole thing of market for algorithms. And what you have to remember on the market for algorithms is that it's very, very difficult to protect uh, intellectual property in the software. And on the other hand, it's cheaper to buy it than to develop it in most of the times. And it's cheaper to buy it and have a strong patent protection or copyright protection on the code than fighting uh, those patent trolls, these guys who buy a lot of patents just for suing you with ensuing with ensuing situations. So this is a whole very complicated thing. If don't you leave the slides I send you, because they are these slides. The ones that you have already in Blackboard and etc. etc. Uh, they get updated before I do that. Yes, sir. Um, Just two words. So if, uh, is the content of the exam going to be coming out of the PowerPoint stuff? No, it's going to be very different. <laughs> okay. uh, I. You don't remember this, but I explained. The exam is not something that you repeat what I told you. The exam is something that I will learn about something that I asked you. And the only thing you will need to really remember is a method of thinking about it. So that's why I say texting in class, uh, playing with your email is not good because you don't learn how to think of it. And of course, that's what I say about CPA exam. Okay, we should learn about about methods of thinking about it, not about specific things to be memorized, because that's going to obsolete very fast. Unfortunately, the CPA exam doesn't know about it. However, I made a good progress. NASPA guys have, have asked me for 30 questions. Which Stanley, by the way, and uh, Stanley has to write those questions that he owes you. So can the exam be like take one? Huh? Can the exam be take one? The exam will be take one unless I change my mind. Okay. Maybe I'll give you it then. <laughs> <laughs> so you know who this guy is? He died about eight years, nine years ago. His name is Dumpling. And he was my dog. And they say dogs and owners look alike. <laughs> okay, and you know, he doesn't have a lot of hair on the top. He has a lot of wrinkles. He had a lot of wrinkles. And he had a terrible disposition. He bit before he asked a question. Okay? Uh, but was something very selective. For example, you guys, he would be in big danger. Because he really didn't like pretty young ladies. Okay? Because my daughter, uh, went to a brilliant fancy school in Manhattan and she made him the mascot and centerfold and put ears on him and he was a centerfold, naked centerfold on her school book. Of course naked was okay with him. Okay? And a lot of little teenage girls giggling at him. He really developed a dislike to young women. Okay? He really hated them. Any friend of my daughter showed up, I went home and hold him out because I figured he was going back. <laughs> now, old, wrinkled guys like me, he ignored. You know, he was totally, totally. And that's the difference between me. I had a very good disposition. He didn't have a very good disposition. And this is Mochi when I bought him over the internet. <laughs> he was bought over the internet in Kansas. He's a child, child. And this is a picture of him ad advertised on the internet. And all of these days, I'll show you the picture of his first day in New York. <coughs> OK. Uh, yes? <laughs> Mochi is <coughs> ice cream. It's a Japanese ice cream, which has a, a kind of cover, flower cover, and ice cream inside from Hawaii in general, 
but it, that is in Japan. You go to Korean restaurants, you can get mochi. Very good. Very good. It's difficult to eat one. You have to eat 20. <laughs> yeah. And when I took my son, we, we, uh, we went for uh, uh, teaching in Hawaii for six weeks. And we were pretty much every day to eat mochi. Good. We are also working a lot in sumo wrestling in Miami. And at that time, it was a long time ago, he was 34 and he was 10. Okay. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a website called Yet Another Hierarchical Object Oriented Site. Yahoo. Oh. Yahoo.com. We didn't discover it because we were looking for Yahoo. We were looking for Akebono.com. Akebono.com was a website about Mr. Akebono, who was the top uh, sumo wrestler in the world. Hawaiian, living in uh, Japan, of course. And the same guy, Jerry Yang, who developed Akebono.com, was a big sumo fan, also had Yahoo. And that was the first search engine, the first well-known search engine. And the search engine was organized by person. They had categories, and you put things under them. Okay, and when AltaVista and a couple of them came out with actual textual search, Yahoo kind of was the other type of website. And they took a long time to recover it. We, we organized it. Now, this is actually a published article, and I think it's still relevant. I use the word electronization. Uh, people use digitalization today. If you look at the McKinsey books or write-ups, they use digitalization. But I say digitalization is a misnomer. Does anyone know what the word misnomer means? Bad naming, bad notation. Thank you. Okay. Why? Because it might not be digital, might be analog. Digital is zeros and ones, or zero to ten in an electronic way. And and you can also design things in waves. And most of the things are analog, which are in waves. So that's why I didn't like the terminology. And you divided the world. I divided the world basically here in five cycles. Uh, one of the cycles was basically marketing, marketing, advertise, zinc, uh, etc. And then the second part was the care part. The third part was the logistics. The fourth part was the financial part. Uh, was the uh, uh, marketing, sales, etc. And finally, there were the others. Which are finance and economics. And the whole message here is that you keep adding electronic capabilities to the business function. And now you talk about RPA, Robotic Process Automation. Institute, that's the word they use, RPA. And what does that mean? It's progressively automating everything. At this time, it was just pure electronization. You are trying to put some things to help with functionality. Now you are trying to automate large parts of the process. Okay. Uh, this is what I wanted to spend some time today talking about. Um, but before I go into this, I want to ask you, what's happening with e-commerce? What are the, and what is e-commerce? Uh, <coughs> buying things online. Buying things online. <coughs> it's growing, it's expanding, it's, it's taking over. Amazon is teaming up or acquiring stores. 
Good, you are doing exactly the right direction. Kevin. I was going to say, uh, also what Tom said, it had gone to the future segment this year, compared to the report that it shows, uh, has also reduced the number of uh, retail stores, and it's creating new ways to engage with the customers as well. Okay, very good, very good. You guys are, I'm going to show a slide very similar to what you're saying. Uh, what else? Let's kind of think a little bit deeper and uh, more directly. What's going to be happening here? What's the next five, 10 years? E-commerce e is basically just replacing commerce in general, um, where you're seeing less and less um, cash transactions and almost everything electronically, and physical manifestations of e-commerce sites or um, you know, just small businesses in general are switching to e-commerce platforms. Okay, very good. What else is going to be happening here, guys? I say guys, but this is females to male. We have this PhD all today, and uh, one of our professors asked a question about women uh, in boards. Okay, and I thought, Ugh. Any sexist question, correct? <laughs> if you ask about male in boards, it would be sexist. Then I looked around and there were eight professors, I can believe eight. There were two guys, me and the uh, Bob. And they're all women. So I said, this is female chauvinism. <laughs> okay, but of course, uh, go ahead. Um, I don't think this is exactly Sellers by some situations by big retail companies dealing directly with sites like Amazon. And what I'm, what I'm just thinking is cutting the intermediate. They're cutting the intermediate. Yes, so, yes. what happened with music, streaming through a service you pay for is much more it's a normal thing to do. Yes. It's not like I'm not going to pay for that. People, a lot of people are. So, maybe that's a, a similar trend or analogy of cutting out the middle person. Okay, let me actually use a word that we typically use this, intermediation. We are eliminating the intermediate. Now, the other word we sometimes use is re-intermediation. You change it to the intermediate it is. Uh, the big examples here are banks, uh, maybe the less than that, travel agents and brokers. <coughs> brokers and travel agents, right? Largely, we didn't even or Okay, and this is not that old of a phenomenon, it's 15 years. Okay, and uh, another term that I want you to Thing is a bit of all good. What is a bit of all good? Who I ask? What is a bit of all good? Uh, yeah, something in bytes, something that's electronic. Is a display bitable? Is music bitable? Yes. Software? Knowledge? What's the characteristic of bitable goods that is so different from physical goods in general? Besides physical existence, it's cost. To build each one of these, there is a big incremental cost. To add a unit to a piece of software or to sell an additional piece of music exactly the same as the other, what is the incremental cost? Very, very small. So that's the big difference. And so when you are taking cost accounting, used to be Professor Sudit, I don't know who is teaching it now, you are going to learn the fixed and variable cost model. This is fixed cost, variable cost, the unit cost, the larger at the bottom goes, becomes smaller. You are going to learn the bit of a good model, which they don't typically teach, which is 
materials. There is a startup cost somewhere here. And then it stays pretty much there. Because developing the software is expensive. But delivering the software is free, a very low cost. So it's a whole different thinking of thinking about this. Okay? See if you understand this. He tells you two big stories. So the blue is 2017. The red is projection for 2022. Does this surprise you at all? I think there are a couple of things that really surprise me here. Peter. I think for me, uh, the biggest surprises would be um, the automated and garden building materials. Yes, yeah, that's my that's one of my surprises. This is very surprised. My wife went and bought a table for a house in Long Island. The table is 750 pounds. And she wanted me to take my car to get it. I said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> okay, and so she thought she had got a great deal until the delivery charge was $500. And I said, spend all this for a table? Anyway. Uh, but that was a garden and building materials. She went physically to buy. Now that's very surprising to me. What else, Peter? What else did you surprise you? Uh, I said the uh, automotive, which in some sense isn't surprising, uh, being that we're in a state that says you can't sell new cars online without a dealership. I went to buy a car electronic. Actually, I bought my last car, not the current car, uh, electronic. I, I wanted to buy, I already had, uh, no, no, I wanted to buy this Toyota, okay? So I went online and looked at a lot of dealers and went into the Toyota website and looked at a lot of, uh, a lot of models, finally decided what I want. And I tried to buy it online. And I went to the first dealer. I had bought it. I had paid $500 down and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. When there, they didn't have the car. OK? And they said, well, we'll get it for you in three weeks. I said, no, thank you. Then I went, then I bought another one online, went there. They didn't have it either, but they had a different column. So I just canceled. And then the third one, I went there and was increased. I live in Manhattan. They had, was waiting for me there. It took me about 20 minutes for the transaction. I did all of it. So they are not ready yet. But this was three years ago, maybe they changed for this. Um, the other thing I find in uh, my experience of buying cars, the information on the internet was music. But some of the Secondary, secondary sources were very good. They had comparisons and etc. I after this car I bought this what I have now, which is a uh, which is an Acura MWD, and this website has ratings. A, has, a, has ratings on quality of the cars, and uh, this one had like uh, reliability of the car. And in my, the Acura didn't have a very great reliability, but my last one, the Toyota, had very good reliability, and I had, I drove 140,000 miles on it, and I never had it back, except I had changed tires on it, and filled it with gas, or nothing like that. But, uh, so it was good. So I didn't worry too much about that. So oh, it's kind of, Japanese is good. It was good. I had to take three times for repair in the first six months. Now it has stabilized. 
that was very uh, impressive how good the website was. And this is all group sourcing, and, and basically they get feedback from you, from all this. Very, very well done. So it's uh, on information, this is difficult. Any other surprises you guys have on this number? Yeah. I would assume that the office equipment and supplies would be higher even than it is because for it seems like But notice one thing, I talked about bitable goods. What did you what did you not notice? Number one, bitable goods, close to 80%. There are still people that buy books, films, and music physically, go to stores. 20%. Should I say number six? No, no, it's safe. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, the other thing to notice is the spread of the projection. And here there is not much more to spread, right? But here, look at this, they expected big increases here. And together with the words fitable goods, I use the words e-commodity. that you don't need to taste, squeeze, try on in order to buy. And my wife goes to the supermarket. She squeezes, she, she bounces a watermelon, literally. She, and her mother, God bless her soul, used to squeeze the chicken before she buy the stick her hand, that all kind of things to the chicken. She's laughing because she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and, and basically, and would you, let me ask you guys, would you buy an expensive dress for online? Alice will say yes. Isabel will say yes. Samantha said no. Now I'm going to ask my Chinese students, would you buy online? Close? Not the expensive ones. Not the expensive ones. How about you, Cashy? I would buy expensive shoes online. Expensive shoes? Yeah, I would like. Uh, like here, there would be like some sale, like uh, one thousand minus two hundred, but you can't get it on Okay, okay. Now, this is a reason to go and buy. You find a rich Brazilian living in the interior of Brazil, she will buy the most expensive dresses online because she'll have it altered, adjusted. Shoes are difficult because it's the wrong side you can't have it altered. Okay, but in general, uh, people are more hesitant to buy food, to buy things that don't fit you well. And by the way, my wife is capable to go to Remember the rule. I can never repeat to my wife or my children what I say about them here. Okay. But my wife can spend the day going to a mall, not buy anything for the entire day, and have the best day when she comes home. <laughs> she's, she's, she's very stingy to do that. Not the way to spend money. Okay? And, and if she buys that, she goes to dollar store and buy something for $5, you know, five things for a dollar. And she is so happy with her purchases. Uh, it's just buying habits. Uh, but uh, you can't do that online. And you know, shopping is a form of entertainment. And uh, it's difficult to replace that form of entertainment for electronic shopping. I actually like electronic shopping. You can see the way I dress that I haven't gone to a store for a long period of time. Uh, I live a block away from Bloomingdale's in the city. The only time I went to Bloomingdale's in the last 15 years was a day was very hot and Mochi was very hot, so we wanted to go through the air conditioning to go to my house. 
<laughs> and the moment you walk with Mochi, you know, hi Mochi. <laughs> so obviously we know who has been walking to my wife or my daughter walking to the <laughs> movie. Okay. Going to the point that you were asking there, maybe they were buying an expensive dress. Yes. Um, I feel like a lot of customers are hesitant or buying something that doesn't fit, but let's go to the article I sent you about Amazon and the work for Joe Prime, which you can get 15 items between three to 15 items, don't pay for them, try it on, and then send it back and just pay for the things you keep. Uh, these things are actually that uh, it's kind of for doing, for being done by smaller companies, like Stylish. So basically, you pay a subscription. Have you heard of my back more? Because I have about 500 in the US. It's starting to move, it's good, useful. Uh, I didn't read really that one. Yeah, so basically, it's just, Attracting more customers that were susceptible, like you know, buying things in line because they were afraid it doesn't have a fit, it's too hit, it's too much trouble to send it back, get the refund. But now Amazon is just cutting that out, just the new things, and you can be, your house becomes your store, basically. Um, you know, my, uh, I, my daughter and my son in law decided to get married uh, two months apart, two, two years ago. So, I had to buy a suit because she, they said my suit was too ugly to hold. I had a suit. I had a suit. <laughs> so I went to suits.com and uh, discovered they had actually a store in Madison Avenue, close to my house, about 15 blocks from my house. So I, me and Mochi went to the store. They let Mochi in. They asked me, they were joking, asked me if Mochi needed a suit. <laughs> Uh, but then I, I had, uh, it, I, they took the measures and then they did it, and they delivered. Okay, it was great. Yeah. Now, my daughter then gets all the linen that I had a suit made for, for his wedding and I was going to wear it on her wedding. No, the other way, my son did it. So I could make another one. And this one, I didn't go there. Right. They had already my measures. I went over there, chose the color I wanted. So, you can buy a suit online, and they you can take your own measures if they want to. It's quite nice. Have you seen suit.com? Not bad. Not bad. Um, but I, I think this is what I call a e commodity. A e commodity is something that you don't need to plan. Okay, or something like that. Uh, in addition to the model Kevin described, Books Brothers, do you know Books Brothers? Books Brothers basically sends a return, uh, a return uh, label to you. And if you don't like it, don't have to explain anything. Just put the label and call them up, they pick it up. Call Fat and Spence, and they pick it up. And I've done that several times with jackets, small jackets, but they are not very good. So I would buy the bullet and go to a store one of these things. And I take more to see if they left in there. Okay, now this is a tragic store. And if you girls are shoppers, this tells your message. So what is this saying? Certain stores are losing sales and increasing rejection. Yeah, the, the, what, I knew this, that stores are being closed. What I did know is this. But this tells you two things. It tells you first, that people are buying more online, we do that. But the second thing it tells you is that, is that you go to a store and then you buy it online. And why would you do that? So you can try it out and then get it for the cheaper online price? Yeah, you, you choose what you want in a physical store and then you go online to find it the cheapest way you can acquire it. Is that dishonest? It's okay. But sometimes 
it doesn't work, correct? We get the wrong thing, they don't deliver. I bought his blue jeans. How would I ever imagine that someone would do blue jeans with buttons instead of a zip? <laughs> okay, I could have returned it, but I went to, to what you guys said here. Oh, bought, bought it. I kept it, but I never used it. But this is actually a very strong story, and uh, I will tell you more about the story here. Okay, look at this. United States retail employment at different levels of, you, you remember the e-commerce deployment? And look, this is the actual, this is projected, and they have three levels of projection. I walk a lot in Manhattan because I walk mochi weekends. And I notice that there are, every block has an open space. And I did kind of link it to this thing. But if you go around Manhattan, Midtown, I think uh, because the economy is doing very well, the real estate owners became a little bit greedy, and people just can't not pay. Pay for it. Uh, and look at the, you know, also the approvals about in their projections. Look, Look at the range between the connections, between the projections. Okay, and this is the slide I mentioned earlier to you. What is this thing saying? They detect cars around them. So that's not a big. Now, okay, you're collecting, you're picking on the safer to drive your car, your self-driving car. What's your motivation to transmit this data to other locations? With a lot of data, bandwidths don't comport with today. Think a little bit. Yeah. If you're translating your data, you can be expect to get some data in return about traffic patterns. Um, okay, it's like that's the waste model, correct? Mm -hmm. You give you something, you sell your eyeballs. That's kind of <coughs> What else, Kevin? Oh, well, I'd say that to, of course, smart cars are communicating to each other. Um, they need to get data to each other. That's the transponder model in the app, correct? Airplane can be transponders. And what is a transponder? It's something that exactly they have to have the same frequency and they avoid collisions between airplanes. And so you have this radio transmitting certain frequency, the other one too. And then you detect that someone's getting close to you. And so cars will have transponders in there to avoid colliding. The problem is that there will be a long period whereby there are cars with transponders and cars without transponders. And so this new generation of cars cannot count on other cars being equipped with what they have. So it's going to have to be a little bit like you, being able to see. My, I was talking about my Acura. My Acura had this automatic braking capability. 
and it has this lay uh, when you go out of the lay BP. And the reason I want this car is because the lay detection feature. My son said, you need a car full of electronics. You love electronics. You need to buy one. So we went to look at a lot of different cars. I didn't really was that interested in the cars. It was fun to go look at a car with my son. Let's go along guy. I don't get to see him that much. So we went and we looked at Lexus. We looked at Acura. We looked at this rip-off, which was the Range Rover. And no electronics, stupid car. Okay. And what the one that convinced me about the Acura was the lane detector. I bought the car, okay? And is there one feature I turn off on the <laughs> Because it beats all the time. <laughs> okay, and my, my son said, you wiggle when you drive. No, it's because New York City has a lousy mayor and the streets are horrendous. And they don't ask me about it. But it has also a feature that is a very feature. It doesn't break for me. Now the new cars do. It detects and goes to big. Break, break, break. And it actually is pretty good, except if I'm driving down the ramp and then it goes up, it sees the bumping front and thinks that that is another car stop. So it goes break, break, break when I don't have to do Now, that's what the design feature that they can improve. And over the years they will. And remember piggyback. What is piggyback? You are going to add features to features. Some of them will be algorithms, changing the algorithm, the other will be entire application on top. And the same application that detect motion motion in my car has this great thing, and I said of your car like this, is that it tells you if a car is moving behind you in your platform. So if I if I put my flasher to the right and there is a car next to me, it's like beep, 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 put a little line up, right now. That will be built into something that surrounds the car. My daughter won't be able to stretch my car like she did it recently, okay? Because it tells you that both sides are there. Um, and this is probably going to be improving the technology. And there'll be a crossing point whereby cars will have less accidents automated than people. And I think we're already there. The question is how far we're going to get. Yeah. Um, I think for like the self-driving cars, uh, the idea of like blockchain and things is definitely going to be like, a big impact on that because if they are generating like 200 gigabytes a minute, all that data needs to be stored somewhere. So the way blockchain you know, things works typically, data can be stored on anyone's computer, so they can use that storage facility. So they'll give you a little benefit to store some of their information temporarily. You know that Amazon collects so much information that they transmit it to their warehouses, to the big, uh, to the big cloud storages by truck. Literally, they kind of put it in big disk drives and they carry it there. Because these days bandwidth is very narrow to transmit compared with the data you collect. No, transmitting 100 gigabytes of information, no one can transmit it in that way. So in order, if they want to really keep that, they're going to have to transmit it in physical medium. And when you go to fill up your car, you plug it in and you transmit it to fiber optics to, to someone. I just invented this. I didn't read that. It not take me very serious. But it did take me seriously because I think this is a You already asked your two questions. Should I let him ask one more question? Yes. <laughs> She's talking about bandwidth. Um, so right in there we have enough bandwidth to transmit all this data. So how do we increase bandwidth? Good question. In 2004, no, sorry, 1994, the US government decided not to finance the internet anymore. So what did they did? They created a schema whereby the network access, the NAP guys, the ones that connect to the mainstream of the internet, to the backbone of the internet, could sell bandwidth. So basically, it was an economic model to pay for the backbone of the internet. And they went to the next thing. They started to DARPA and ARPA financing bandwidth. 
and they multiply bandwidth capability with the same conduit by a factor of a million, it's still not there. It's still not, it, it's not even close. Have you ever tried to buy a terabyte of information at, at Apple or at uh, Microsoft that then transmit your music and your pictures into there? You will spend months uploading information. I gave up on, on buying Google Cloud location because the bandwidth transmission, even from my house, my house is uh, middle of Manhattan, has very good bandwidth. Take forever. Only thing I could do is bring our music to Rutgers, which had better bandwidth, and try to do that. But that's a thing. Uh, but yeah, bandwidth, you know, if you compare storage, the way it's grown, with bandwidth availability from your location, and every year the disparity is bigger and bigger. So, are uh, these projections taken into account and uh, bandwidth? This big projection is basically a projection of stored, things stored on the web, okay. on the internet, not things bandwidth transmission during data storage. That's what that's what they are talking about. Um, My friend Ken Church, when I was at Bell Labs 10, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, said that at that time, the size of the entire web, uh, maybe not 20, uh, 20 years ago, was about three paperbacks. Paperbacks is 1,000 of a zip. Okay, to tell you how this thing grew. And so this is a new oil, but now look at this. This is the one I mentioned earlier. Did you understand this already? <laughs> this is companies mentioning AI in earnings calls. Now you understand why I had Sophia come here and talk to you a little bit about AI? And you know, back to you, John, just to react to what you said, um, I'm not totally sure that all the applications that people are talking about blockchain are going to be, exist. Okay, uh, I don't understand it very well. We actually are talking about blockchain tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I just read up a little bit on it. Yeah, no, it's, you guys are going to learn a lot about blockchain. Okay, more maybe than, than I know at this current stage. Because I have, um, we have Andrea, we have Jungsen, we have June, what am I missing? Jamie. Jamie, yeah. Jamie, four PhD students working in blockchain project, June just published a paper, and we are starting to work with a company called Libra, who sells who sell blockchain and want to work with us. So you're going to hear a lot of, of, about blockchain. I'm just not totally sure. Some things, I, I don't think that I have too much of a doubt that some applications of blockchain are really going to happen, and I won't be ready with already. Bitcoin is a real application of blockchain. And I think Ethereum is a real application of blockchain. I just don't know if everything is not stable a lot. So I don't know. And I also don't know if blockchain is a place to store massive amount of let's say car information. I think blockchain is better for transactions. You know more about this. What do you think, Andrea? I think it will be better for identity management, for example, but in terms of the, the size, I don't know that it, it will be the most efficient way to do that. Yeah. On the other hand, I think there might be some mass, massive information storage associated with blockchain. I don't know. It's very, it's very interesting to think about this. From what I've read, I mean, it just sounds like it's just like basically transactions that can't be copied. So like when something is like transacted from um, one person to another, or something, I guess. Yeah, that's the, a natural application. Yeah. yeah, blockchain was created associated to Bitcoin. Although the research behind it um, is not from this guy who created Bitcoin, what what an artist who, who doesn't exist is a, not knows who it is. But anyway, it was an application for having many chains of this thing, blockchain, uh, each one with the same information as the other after the block had built, and so no one could change it because the sequence of the blocks 
If you change it here, we change everything up there, and it'll be different from this one. Is that correct? Yeah. So for accounting, I think blockchain will be a good technology to use because it gives you a really good audit trail, right? We don't want to have any accounting fraud. But for storing like car information, I don't know if that that's going to be the best use of the blockchain because it's really expensive to record the transactions. But it may. In the future, we I'm not sure. Wondering. We are wondering. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't tell you. We are going to keep it very secret and make some money on it. Correct. Uh, no, we don't do that. Okay. You do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, it could be. It could be. I just no, don't know. Okay, you mentioned Amazon and Home. Let's talk about them. Does it is like thirteen and a half billion dollars for what's the number exactly? What's the point of that? 13.7. That's a lot of money. He doesn't think so. 13.7, and if I recall correctly, is about 450 stores around the United States. Donald Trump. Donald Trump, according to his disclosure, is worth 1.4 billion dollars. Okay, and so. My prediction earlier about him was that he wasn't as rich as he claimed he was. He only has a billion dollars. And well, I know something about Donald Trump. This is not political advice. Uh, Donald Trump had all this catastrophic business deal he did in, uh, in Atlantic City, correct? He bankrupted three casinos. He didn't bankrupt the environment casino. Bankrupted, and the last one he put seventy million dollars of his personal debt on a public company. Okay, uh, and then I think he soured up on owning real estate, and so what he does now he sells his name for fancy properties. So in order to have a term name building, you have, have to pay two percent royalty on the gross revenue of your of your hotel or your building and keep a certain level of standards. Now, I know a guy who is an auditor for Donald Trump if the standards are being maintained. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's a very cash-rich model because you don't invest anything and you make 2% of income. Not a bad deal. Don't say a bad deal. I don't know if things are being alive or really belong to him or not. I don't. But that's his, his model. But if you look at this, and then you compare this with things like other things that were purchased at exorbitant prices on the internet, they are in a bad business. I just happened yesterday, was driving back from Long Island with my son, and he has his podcast. And the guy who started Whole Foods was talking about Whole Foods. <laughs> and the very interesting thing that happened, I meaning this is a real, he, he said, I started, I became vegan, and I started a store for hippies in Austin, Texas. And all my clients were hippies. That's the word he was using. And then, um, and then he got $50,000 to start it from relatives. And in the first year, he lost and he bought the store. He invented the store, was off the beaten path. And the first year, he lost half of his money. And the second year, he made $5,000. And his entire clientele were hippies. And at that time, meaning this was early 80s, um, this kind of healthy food business was just for hippies. You know, wouldn't be like my daughter today that my, my grandchildren only eat organic food. They cost twice as much as the other side. Okay. And then he bought a second store, he created a second store. And the store was in the highway, it was a burned down building. And he managed to convince the owner of the building to refurbish it for him. He got he went to a baseball game. And he was desperate because of his $50 finances and 
more money in the business. So he was, when he played baseball, he discovered a guy arrived in a BMW. So he, said, he asked him, how come is he get Oh, he doesn't work, he has, he got a lot of money from his son. So he went there and convinced this guy to give $50,000 to him for starting the store. And they started the second store, and they made money in the first month. And they had a good recipe. And all hippies buy it, continue to keep in business. And a year later, or not even a year later, six months later, in the, this was a flood area, the whole thing got flooded in. So he was going to go out of business, and what happened is the hippies came and helped him to clean up the store, to rebuild part of the store. So they, he had this kind of very religious following. And then he started the store in Boston, uh, and then the thing went, went really, really expensive. But We'll continue this story in a second. Look at how many stores he had. 450 stores all around the US. And he has, look at this, 1.4 was American grocery, grocery mark. I, when I, when he, I heard him saying that yesterday, and I was surprised, 1.4. Whole food, you see it everywhere. And my, my wife says, it is because you just go to fancy areas. That's what she said. Okay. Um, but 1.4. Uh, you know, 1.4, and just think about this, extrapolate 1.5 for 450. There are 30,000 or something stores in the United States of grocery. There are a lot of grocery stores. So just going through this, because this is relevant to what we're doing. The people shop at the chain are not a mass market. They wear hippies, and what happened? is that he says that in, in his web uh, podcast, he says that progressively he started noticing non-hippies coming in. But the non-hippies were affluent non-hippies. And like my daughter, one that hit people. And then he, he had a competing store before he started the second point, a competing store. He went there and tried to convince them to merge with him. And he claims he did it because he liked the people that were running this. And they convinced him to sell non-vegan things, like meat. And that's one of the reasons of his success, because people don't want to go to a grocery store just to buy some of the groceries. They want to buy all the groceries. So that's what he got. Oh, another interesting story that he, he said, I thought was good, and asked where you have been on the some attack, and how do you deal with this attack? And do you pay any attention to what people say? He said his people of animal rights came to him and fussed a lot about the, the meat that he was selling, and uh, that the, the animals were slaughtered in unhumane conditions. And he went and looked at many of these, and he got indignant. Is he still? Okay got indignant and he changed all his purchasing habits. Now, you can believe it, you cannot believe it. But that's very, very interesting type of story. Okay? Um, and basically, that these buyers are higher bonds. Uh, Mr. Bezos had, had made no big announcements about change of whole food. Uh, like drone delivery is not yet ready to, to happen. Although it's going to happen. Soon the types of drone delivery is going to happen. Um, I just want to hear from you, speculate. Why is Amazon buying Whole Foods? I want someone else. But if no one volunteers, why well, I volunteer? Um, <laughs> I think it's a combination of wanting to be able It's very surprising, isn't it, this whole thing? Well, maybe they're going in with a high end name like Whole Foods, for right away. If you're buying Whole Foods or getting Whole Foods to 
Amazon, maybe more stores will come in. They're not starting to buy those saying, we get the best we can get. Why is it that small? I want to remind you something. Amazon, for the first eight years or 10 years, I don't know how many years, lost money. And Bezos, unlike many US entrepreneurs, is not a short term investor. He goes for the long time. He's much more interested on growth than he's interested on this year's profit margin. He owns a good part of Amazon, so he's not terribly worried about it. He's very, very rich. This is looking at what? Characteristics of the neighborhood. Age distribution, and look at this. Young people, older people. Well, you know what is a bit surprising? Pretty similar. Yeah, bachelor's degree. Less than high school. Householder income. Rich, much less rich. So what is this telling you? They're opening their stores where the people are willing to pay the high prices for their goods. Very selective in location. This is really but sort of uh, I know Fairway had a huge they almost went bankrupt because they didn't do that. They opened stores in places with lower But when they expand to New Jersey and stuff, they went to towns that weren't as affluent as the, like Midtown New York and things like that. So it wasn't shopping at them, they were shopping at ShopRite and Popmart instead. Uh, so they all of a sudden closed almost all of them except for New York ones. They opened their own place. I just closed Fairway when the first one. 70th Street and Broadway. My, my wife used to make me go there and carry her bags. Look at this. Shares of a large group of rivalry grocery funds immediately when this offer was announced, including Walmart and Kroger, sink quickly. And now, now we can just. Amazon, the whole food is important not for what it represents now, but how it might transform Amazon and up end rivals, most notably Walmart, Walmart in the future. Do you ever think five years ago that something that Amazon, no, ten years ago, Amazon did would affect Walmart? Walmart was the king. 
Yes. So going back with Walmart, actually, with the recent things that Amazon has been doing, may Walmart purchase JetBlue, uh, Jet, sorry, Jet.com, which is a e-commerce uh, website that we run with. So it is. That's my first example, correct? Right? There is that. Uh, dot com company is going for that. Jet is the example, correct? Right? It, it was purchased in 2016. Last year. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the Amazon whole figure is important, not for what we represent now, but for how it might transform Amazon and other. A growing share of office supplies, the clothes you are talking about office supply, and those are bought online. Yet last year, e commerce accounted for only just percent of American spending in foods and drinks. It's difficult to have to have a glass and one single coke delivered to your house, correct? <laughs> yes. You order cokes? No. I just want to say that Amazon is so so wants to be like a cost leader, but Whole Foods is operating the niche market and by selling premium products at a premium price. So uh, I think Amazon bought Whole Foods also because of Amazon's 365 private label, so that we can make organic food more accessible to everybody. Okay. okay. Now you, this is what you mentioned here. Someone mentioned here uh, linking Whole Foods to Amazon Fresh and Prime Now. Maybe that's the reason they went for it. They need the they need the distribution locations and 450 distribution locations is good. Grocery margins are low and it's good the value is hard to deliver. Peaches, boots, meat, rocks. Many consumers like to buy food in person, like my wife. Okay, unlike choosing a master of book, selecting the right tomato requires inspection, squeezing, and every other thing you want to do with food. Or trusting someone who has. Okay, now, this is my third thing in, in my article, in my book about this, is the value of bread. Or trusting someone who has. Trusting someone who has is bad. <coughs> so, look at these components here. Interesting. Obviously, everything that is visible is much better common e commerce prospect. If it's not an e commodity, it becomes more difficult to e commerce it. E-commerce commodity is a commodity that you don't need to dry, squeeze, or whatever. And if it's not an e-commerce commodity, brand helps a lot. But brand helps in the other things too. Okay, so what did we conclude here? We are not totally sure why they bought, they are trying to buy Whole Foods. The price compared with digital data type of companies is very cheap. I mean, they paid for, they paid, what was, 22 million, billion for WhatsApp? With 17 toys or something like that? Yeah. Um, so, most of, uh, if you are in India, a lot of Indian people love WhatsApp, so, I speculate that one of the reasons Facebook bought WhatsApp was it happened in the Indian market. I think people, uh, at least economists, say that WhatsApp was just a play to eliminate competition. 
successful DNA competition. Because, you know, with a very large price spending there, and I had this discussion yesterday with my son. My son, um, besides running a marathon runner, he's a buy side analyst with a long term investment type of company. Uh, so he, and he's now following technology. So I was just asking ex exactly questions of, of this, this nature. And I was especially asking him questions about now that there is 80% or more of all trades are electronic, what's the value of publishing a financial statement? Do you use financial data? Oh, it's very important. Do you use it? It's very important. What does that mean? mean that he does it. He says, well, we use many other things. He wouldn't tell me what he uses. Okay? But I think there's a lot of judgment into it and etc. The thing that he called my attention that I actually and I should have thought didn't think of it is at least trading models, trade on volume, trade on price. Okay. But what he said is, you also have models compete uh, with the competition. What happened to your competition? Uh, this industry will happen to you. And kind of those correlated models of different um, of different industries and different companies and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's still on price. It's still uh, maybe even baselines it with financial statements. Um, you are talking about book value to equity here earlier, uh, book value to market. I don't think anyone pays attention to book value, but it's a baseline. So that someone pays some attention to this. It, it's very interesting. Now, this thing about second economy is, is again, Jorson and McAfee, we talked around about this. Uh, in 1805, the decade before Civil War, the United States was so, 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 so. 40 years later was the size of Italy. 40 years later, because of the railroads, they came to reach. Um, that was a transformative. And, and so what is the second economy? It's fast, silent, connected, unseen, and autonomous. And this is something that people sometimes don't understand uh, about these things like Amazon selling and etc. They have at the execution they don't have people involved. This is all automatic. Now if you make analogy to that, what is what auditing will be if it's all internet connected? No people there. But there are a lot of people managing it, making it happen, supervising. Uh, it's remotely executing and global, always and on and endlessly configurable. Now, this is word global. Is it really global? Is the search engine in China the same as the search engine in the US? Is Amazon in China? Yes. Big? Is Google big in China? And why? Okay, if you want to be nasty, you say it's because of the big firewall. If you want to be less nasty, which I think is a probably more true story, is if I can have a Chinese company dominate this market, why am I going to let American companies dominate? I would do the same thing in Italy, I would do the same thing in Brazil. Correct? Protect your own industries. Create employment for that's why governments are paid, isn't it? Why do you pay for your government? Yeah, to make you richer, safer, maybe safer first, richer second. To make sure that people are not starving on those steps. So uh, it, there is, it's not only about the security and that intention. It's protecting your economics. And of course, President Trump says that. Yes. <laughs> it's difficult to know what he says, right? Did you see the piece in the New York Times? This thing, Trump lies? Yeah. It was kind of funny. This is just a question of, uh, of what to classify. Okay? This, by the way, this was written 
couple of years ago. It is concurrent, which means that everything happens in parallel. It's self-configuring, it may constantly reconfigure itself on the fly, and is increasing, also self-organizing, self architecture self-heal. self heal Internet fixes itself? Yeah. Yeah. That is the thing called Hadoop. What is Hadoop? Is you have a million computers here, you have a layer on top of it, which is an operating system like Linux. Okay? And when you give it a request, it distributes those requests to this million computers. If one of those computers dies, something someone else takes care of it. It's self-healing. Okay, basically it doesn't go there and physically fixes that computer, but it corrects the functioning of the data retrieval. So it is self-healing. Now, there are chips that are self-healing that actually correct themselves. There are chips that actually just eliminate a part of the chip and start using the rest of the chip. But someone's getting there. I just wanted to show you this. I kept some of the older <coughs> slides here because there are things that I couldn't find to show you, uh, modern versions. This is actually very interesting. Is um, this Apple iPhone 4? Do you still remember? Do you have, is this not like some of the story that you are not born yet? This is a, this is real here. This iPhone is maybe four years ago. iPhone 4. Look at the. Uh, look at the cost breakdown. Okay, camera, $13.70. Display and touch kit, $38. DRAM, $16. But if you put this all together, it was costing about 60 to 70%. The physical cost of the thing for the device. And if you look at that, who is the biggest supplier? Samsung. And who is the biggest competitor? Samsung. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> did they stop being? Did they stop buying chips from, from Samsung? No. Of course not. And so this is actually modern, <laughs> modern electronics. Is you are competitor and you are also supplier and you also acquire it. Okay, and this is actually total cost, average sale, total cost, $178. Mm -hmm. Sales price, 560 so it's about 60% of what happened. I don't like the hardware business. Do you guys like the hardware business? Mm -hmm. It's much better to develop a piece of software that the incremental cost of selling is zero. Do you buy from your, from your competitors in the software business? Of course, you use the same components. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, Android. All the different forms of Android, like Nugget, Micro, all the pop, all come from the same software. It's just a way to develop the specific form of the feature. So it's an adaptation. Yeah. So this is a very incestuous world. If Samsung would have a crisis in Korea and go out of business, what would happen to iPhone? No switch supplies. Huh? Even no switch supplies to what's it, Intel? Well, uh, now, uh, this is something I, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, but I don't really have a lot of slides about this. And um, I have the PhD student here, Steve Kozlowski. And uh, I wanted him, we, we talked about the dissertation, talking about, about the ecosystem. And the ecosystem was a series of components that would supply continuous audit. So, and you know, when you talk about your cell phone, you're yeah, actually talking about its functioning as an ecosystem. When you talk about Amazon, 
it's functioning is an ecosystem. What does it mean? Amazon delivers over wireless, correct? And the Kindle delivers over wireless and they need someone to deliver. And then they need a piece of it to repair. And they need a piece of it to update. And they need a piece of it for marketing. So these days, when you create a product, you have to think about the whole electronic ecosystem around it. And to Steve, I had, for some reason, I couldn't be in his seminar, and so I was listening uh, to some device, and I couldn't talk. And my colleagues jumped off. You remember that? When they jumped over, asked, what are the lions in this ecosystem? And what is the tiger in this ecosystem? They had no idea what they're talking about. Poor Steven, I wasn't there to defend him. I took revenge because I had him doing the game and then I, I, I told him he don't know what they're talking about. But poor Steve, he was in. But look at this, pioneers such as Amazon have built cloud-based ecosystems <coughs> that make content such as an electronic book widely available. Even though the firm has its own e-reader, the Kindle, and has hatched the tablet computer to it. It also has created apps and other software that let people get to the digital stuff on all sorts of devices, including PCs. I just want you to think about this a little bit because this is a very big example of the whole e-commerce arena. Okay, why would I, Amazon, create a store, an electronic store that sells electronic books, have a device that delivers this, the Kindle, and I still would create an app to show my books on a PC or on an Apple. Why would I do that, compete with myself? I'm selling. It's very obvious. Increase your market share by giving people alternatives. Okay. Remember, Mr. Bezos is big on market share. He didn't make money for years. He wanted growth. Was he right? Amazon, was he right? So many years without profit. Losing money? By the way, how did he survive losing money? Oh, went into the public markets, got credit. So you're getting that. Well, so what happened here? Market share? What, what was he selling? What was Amazon selling? Not you. Was it selling one thing? Kindles? What was it selling? It was selling its ebooks. It was selling its ebooks and other services. The main thing you were selling is books, electronic books, which they got a commission for. And do you prefer to sell an electronic book or a physical book? Why? Yeah, it's bitable good. No boxing. No Federal Express, no Prime, all of those. You already have the ecosystem set up because you're selling it. So that selling the Kindle is just a side product. Yeah. The money is in the books. And it also open up for people who would write their own books and publish it itself. So like a lot more. Oh, subsidiary <laughs> markets. Self publishers. Yeah, who else? You know, they are experts. Amazon uh, Amazon is an expert on subsidiary markets. Amazon hosts 
over 10,000 subsidiary, subsidiary stores in their infrastructure. So yeah, they're opening a market, they're doing other businesses with it. Some of them tiny. Okay, rice tiny, see if it gets big. So they're competing with themselves. I was furious. I have my iPad, and my iPad could be a grandfather. Is like number one, uh, number the first generation of iPads, and my Kindle is not working. This Kindle is not working my iPad, so I tried to upgrade my software, and the software said the yes, computer is too old. We can only upgrade it partially. So I upgraded it. Kindle continues not working. Called customer service. Amazon is it good for customer service, correct? But customer service, when I got to them very easy, they call you back. I was impressed with that. They call you back, but that wasn't the tech guys. Finally, they got the tech person, strongly suspected she was in India, okay? And she couldn't resolve it. And so I'm in the dilemma, if I continue trying, or I buy a new iPad. And my wife, of course, said, you don't need another iPad, you have you have your laptop, you have your cell phone, my son said that. And why do right, you need that? Uh, so I'm in this dilemma. No. But I like to carry my, my, my beautiful Lenovo and my iPad and my cell phone when I travel. Never know what I need. So one of you raise a hand, no? No? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah. Okay. And so this is kind of competition. And of course, the Motorola story kind of falls apart. Okay. And Apple is, of course, have an ecosystem competing. Okay. One little trigger question. How do you do this, Andrea? You didn't teach me. I told Andrea what Confucius said. If you give me a fish, Sashi eats me one time. If you teach me to fish, it's a lifetime. So she's teaching me to fish. Oh, okay, what did you do? Teach me. Oh, okay, I understand. How did you start the poem? Oh, you have to start. To see the play uh, on it, and then yeah. have 30 seconds to answer, and that's it. So this is fancy. The other one that I had, uh, we have the clippers still upstairs. Uh, a little bit more complicated. You put the box in, etc., etc. I like the old one better. You want to see this piazza? Piazza is easy to do. Yeah, I think most people now will have a cell phone app that is a clipper. Yeah. Yeah. But we still haven't got that one. Okay, yeah, let's go. C is qualifying it. A, eh, you can have, I think everyone is right on this one, correct? You can have a, you know, you have a hamburger stand. You don't need an ecosystem for that. Uh, but it would be nice to have one to bring some clients to order, uh, to have deliveries in your place. You don't have to go getting it. Uh, but in general, I usually use a, a little graph. A little graph that goes like this. Yeah. And you sell good, physical goods, they go like this. Yeah. However, progressively, you create an electronic chain in parallel with the physical goods and becoming wider and wider, doing things like supplies, doing things like marketing, 
doing things like electronic ordering, and the car manufacturers are the best. You know, they for the first years of the internet, they had nothing on the e-commerce. They said, oh, we can't sell a car electronically. And it turned out that they now have a pretty big position in that you can, for example, configure it in Europe. You can configure a car over the internet and order it. Okay? And they'll deliver the car to your house. Uh, and you can put all the kind of devices you want in there. You try to do that in the United States. What happens? Happens what happened to me and dealer. I go to the dealer, they not only don't have the car, when they have the car, it's not the car that I want. It's just the kind of education of the of the consumer and etc. That doesn't evolve the way it should evolve. Some of them are free, some of them are not free. And most of the apps that are popular have versions, at least a couple of versions. It has Apple version and non-Apple version, and etc. Okay? And many of them are free. And so they are developed for the purpose of supporting something else. And they are, that's why I asked you that, that question before. Why do you start the Kindle? If you're selling Kindles, you give apps to something else. Because you want a larger market for other things that you are selling. So that's very clear. But there is a whole set of apps that you don't get. There are apps that are intermediate construction bridges for other things. And these are the software makers that sometimes they sell it, sometimes you get it in the public site. Um, and app is an other word for computer program or script. Uh, this is another thing. Uh, this is actually something that is not that important today. They don't talk so much about it. Is the idea of your laptop or your cell phone being yours or being of your company. Meaning, if you work for ENY, you better not use your personal computer for that job. And if, when I work with my friends at ENY, when they want to do something which is computational, they say, can you do this in your computer, please? Because the thing is loaded with cybersecurity devices, apps, and protections, and et cetera, et cetera, because there is low. However, many companies now, particularly with the cell phone, don't require you to carry your cell phone and their cell phone. They actually let you use one cell phone, they give you a cell phone and pay the bill. That's good and that's bad. Why is it good? Why is it good? Okay, John? Um, okay, we bad. You say, like, track anything or see what you're, like, you might be doing that. Like, yeah. You know the law about devices or things in your office, correct? <coughs> Everything you do, you speak on the phone, they can take the call. You leave anything in the desk of your, uh, of your office, they can confiscate, or they can at least read. Okay, everything you do in the work computer belongs to them. That meaning the company. Now, if this is your personal cell phone that they finance, that's a little more legally questionable, correct? A little bit questionable. Many companies actually have internal rules about not being uh, not being too intrusive on your person, personal life. Now, what happened with 
miss his calendar. Now I talk about Mr. Trump, I can talk about Mr. Clinton. It keeps you awake. <laughs> because I don't need to bring a cartoon in or, or show you a video. Either. Do you use that private email server uh, while operating Secretary of State? And why was that the crime? Because she was sending and receiving highly classified information, or potentially highly classified information. Let's suppose that it wasn't classified information. Is that a crime? Um, I think the rules of the Department of State is that official business should be on Department of State computers. Is a rule. Is it a crime? Mm -hmm. Sending cl classified documents from non-classified mail server is clearly illegal. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those documents that she was accused of sending classified were actually exposed classified. You know what that means? They were not classified when she sent it, and then they were classified later. And is this a do you think this is a major crime for this system? Well, what do you think? <laughs> well, I worked for the Department of Labor, so I was always telling everybody she broke the rules, she didn't commit a crime. If she was still a senator or worked for the government, she could have been fired. But at the time that they did the investigation, she was no longer a senator, she was no longer a Department of State, she was running for president, which she was not holding a position in the government. So she couldn't have been fired, because she didn't have a government the, the, position the at the point time. point is well taken, but that doesn't leave me anywhere. Did she do something wrong? <laughs> Aren't you? See, I want to make other people think here a second and ask. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say it was definitely a moral gray area. So that she was in possession of the server that she was using for state documentation for all state business. Um, but at the same time, she was doing that with a pretty significant precedent. Like I think Colin Powell um, and a few other um, major American politicians. Colin Powell did it before. Right. So the precedent came from somewhere else. Now, she took it to the extreme. She created her own server at home, and she was using it. OK, you know what most people do? What do most people do? Your business mails come from your business account. Your personal mails, you go to Google, or Yahoo, or whatever. Would that be a crime? Would that be a crime? I'm asking her here. Oh, she's distracted. So, would that be a crime? You go to your. Would that be a crime if uh, you were, if you your personal mail you are sitting in your computer at the Department of Labor and you sign in in Yahoo and send the mail out? It wouldn't be a crime. She'd be breaking the rules, and there could be she could be fired. Fired, but not a crime. Correct. Okay. Yeah, actually, it's touchy because if you are in your job and using the computers of your job. Technically, what you do in the computer of your job is company kind of. Is that correct? No? Yeah. It's, I know, it's very difficult to the students here. We had this discussion many times. Um, now, if someone is using their own laptop or their own iPad on the telephone network from your job, that's even more murky, but it's still in your location, it's still work time. So I think my wife was CFO or head of internal audit of six, seven universities. Okay. And she never did personal mail out of the university mail. And anything she got personal in her university, she deleted. I said, that doesn't delete anything. They have no backups of it. But she thought she was deleting it. And of course, then she couldn't find anything that she needed. She came asking, yeah, this mail is a mail, I keep all my emails. I never delete any. So Google has a lot of information about me. 
But remember what I said. Privacy is gone, but I'm not very interested. If I do something bad, I'll become interested. We didn't resolve Mrs. Clinton, we didn't resolve Mr. Trump. Sorry about that. You guys are tired, aren't you? Okay, I'll see you next Monday. Next Monday we have the start of our presentations, correct? And uh, congratulations for the group who had a baby. <laughs> <laughs>